So hello everyone. Welcome to another uh, researchers in VR event. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, some emojis, somebody give me some emojis if you can hear me. Michael's giving me some emojis. Yeah. All right, perfect, thank you guys. Um, so welcome today. Uh, our speaker today is going to be Rob Thoreau. Um, Rob is the immersing, immersive technology lead at uh, Georgia College. Um, President of the Canadian chapter of the Immersive Learning Research Network, author, researcher, blogger, speaker, ed tech enthusiast, and VR owner, and we will be getting to him in just a few minutes. And he's gonna share with us some of the work that they've been doing at the college that he's at. Um, some really amazing work. Some of the pictures I've seen look incredible. Um, really cutting edge. So um, before we do that, I just wanna touch base with you. So as you know, we are researchers in VR. We are a group that is connected um, with educators in VR, the broader group. Um, and we host these events every Monday, these uh, researchers in VR events. Um, sometimes we have guest speakers, sometimes they're more networking and discussion. So you're always welcome to join mm -hmm. us every Monday. Um, the goal here is really to just explore uh, XR technologies and just bring that, share that knowledge amongst people who are interested and researchers who are interested, both academic researchers and non-academic researchers as well. If you'd like to join our newsletter, we have a bi-weekly newsletter that comes out, just tells you a little bit about the events that are coming up and um, events that have happened and upcoming research that's going on in VR that you might wanna get involved with or that you might find interesting. Um, so that is our First one, who am I? This is me, I'm talking to you on the stage. My name is Anthony Chasson. I'm a professor of psychology at Mount Royal University in Calgary in Canada. And um, I do a virtual reality nature therapy, a little bit of research into that. And I also teach in virtual reality or will be coming up a new university course. Um, mm -hmm. So that's who I am. And this is the mission statement for researchers in VR. So. You can see here, Researchers in VR is an online XR community <clears throat> that supports academic researchers and industry professionals by hosting Altspace VR events to encourage knowledge sharing, collaboration, discussion, assisting research activities, participation recruitment, and data collection. So that is what we do. That's the overview of kind of what we're here to do. Um, and Rob's talk today will fit right into that. So I'll just put this last slide up. It says, get involved. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter or you can join our discussion on Discord. So you can always post up questions on Discord if you have research questions. Hey, I'm trying to do this with my Oculus Go and I don't know how to get it to do that. Sometimes, you know, other researchers that work in the field, we all struggle <laughs> with the same problems sometimes. And so we often uh, have familiar solutions. And before I bring Rob to the forefront, uh, the last thing I will say is um, this event is also part of the Univirtual event. So Univirtual is a month long event being hosted mm. by educators in VR. There's over 150 live events going on over the course of this month. So feel free to check them out. The Univirtual schedule, you can go to, uh, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember educators in VR's website address off the top of my head. I was just gonna say it, but it's probably it was on one of those previous slides. Anyway, uh, educatorsinvr.com, no, edinvr.com, anybody know? It <laughs> doesn't matter. You can I look it up. EDVR. Educators in VR. Margie probably mm -hmm. knows. Margie probably knows. But she's not going to say anything. <laughs> oh, she's thinking about it. <laughs> Are you still muted? I think you're muted. No, no. She's just really faint. Not on, uh, <laughs> she's not megaphoned. Not megaphoned. Wait, she's working on it. I put her on the spot now. Okay, there I am. There we go. Um, if you just put educators of VR in the search engine, right. it'll come up. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> cool, thank you. <laughs> so check out Educators in VR, the Univirtual event. There's all kinds of really fascinating events going on this month. So feel free to check that out. Okay, all that babbling being said, uh, it's time for Rob to do his thing. So Rob, I hand the stage over to you and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, really great to be part of this event. Um, uh, so a little bit about my background. I actually come from a healthcare background. I've uh, been a paramedic for 35 years and teaching paramedics for the last 20 years. Um, I've also been a, an ed tech enthusiast for, for many years since the start of my teaching career. Um, uh, 
I uh, actually started uh, screencasting in 1999. I started um, um, also synchronous online learning in 1999. Um, I learned how to flip the classroom in 2000, which was about eight years before flipping the classroom became a thing. I've been podcasting since about 2005, and um, my, my paramedic students have access to my podcasts on Spotify and iTunes. Um, Anyway, I, I've dabbled with a lot of different educational technolo technologies, but I'm also uh, a skeptic, and I really think it's important to um, you know, be aware of our sometimes enthusiasm that doesn't uh, translate into effective learning or teaching. And um, uh, I also have uh, two degrees, but I've never been to university. Um, I have an undergraduate degree from uh, Victoria University in Melbourne, Australia, which I did online. I have a master's degree in educational technology, which I also did online. <laughs> so <laughs> my my plan at some point is to go to Australia and go to uh, British Columbia to uh, both of those schools to sit, sit down in the pub and have a beer. Um, but uh, my point is that um, I have a good understanding of what online learning is all about. And uh, the online learning that I experienced was a very isolated experience. It was asynchronous. Uh, it was not terribly engaging. It required a tremendous amount of self-motivation. And one of the things I knew before going into either of those degrees and, and going through those degrees just reinforced in my mind is that we need connections with each other. We need human connections. Um, and we just don't get that so much in asynchronous. And some people thrive uh, in an asynchronous environment, and I managed OK. Um, but what I also found is that, um, you know, I really needed to connect with other students to discover basic things like, okay, it turns out I'm not the only one who doesn't understand this assignment. And so I think a synchronous approach is really important. And this just ties in with where I'm going with um, when I want to talk about virtual reality in just a minute. So, um, uh, Tony, you can go ahead and uh, move to the next slide there. Uh, so, I'm at uh, Georgian College in uh, Barrie, Ontario, Canada, which is about an hour north of Toronto, you know, um, city of Toronto. And uh, we're on beautiful Campbellville Bay. It's a nice, small city of about 145,000 people. We have 30,000 students, seven campuses, and um, we've had uh, virtual reality at, at Georgian College for about four years. The first program to introduce Virtual reality was our architectural technology program, and it's well ensconced in, in curriculum there. And um, uh, I started exploring virtual reality um, in my, um, my master's degree and became interested in its potential, uh, its potential pedagogical value. Um, and the first virtual reality experience I had was at a conference in Washington, D.C. It was a uh, it was a patient simulation experience, and what I saw when I went past this exhibitor booth was someone wearing a virtual reality headset, and uh, what I, I could see what this person was seeing on a large screen TV. And what I saw was an animated patient sitting on the edge of a bed and someone talking to them. And, and quite frankly, when I looked at it, it, it wasn't impressive to me at all. I thought, man, eh, this just looks like any other simulation that I've seen on a on a 2D screen. And then I put the headset on, and uh, like most of you, like most people who experience virtual reality for the, for the first time, it was a real wow experience. I was standing in front of this, this animated patient who was struggling to breathe, and I could hear him struggling to breathe. I could see his shoulders heaving as he, as he tried to uh, catch his breath. And when I asked him questions, he was only able to speak four, maybe five words between taking breaths. I could walk over to his his, um, his uh, uh, night table and pick up his medications. And by looking at the names of his medications, I could discern what his other medical history was. I could take his vital signs. I took a stethoscope and listened to his chest and could hear abnormal breath sounds. Uh, and then I could treat him. And, and with a click of a button, we could end up in the back of the ambulance. And I could do some ongoing assessments and treatments. Um, but two things really struck me when I came out of that experience. One, I couldn't stop saying, wow. Uh, I might have sworn a few times as well. And um, two, uh, it struck me that 
I got the same twinge of adrenaline that I get as a paramedic when I see someone who's really sick and I think I need to treat this person quickly, assess them quickly, treat them quickly before they get any worse. Now, the second thing that really struck me was that this was learning with not just the ability to do things with my hands, that was incredible, but also it was context. And when I think about my first year paramedic students or first year nursing students or first semester trade students, um, to, you know, you can talk in theory about things and you can show images on a screen with a PowerPoint, um, but it doesn't give you the same context. To actually be there in that place, that kind of context was really powerful to me. Uh, and I was really blown away by it. <clears throat> and so um, I introduced virtual reality into our paramedic program, and um, that led to, uh, uh, I was really, um, I really, really wanted to um, introduce virtual reality and augmented reality, particularly virtual reality, to a large number of faculty. So uh, I put together a small team of faculty who started um, uh, Story how we do this, and we decided the, the best thing to do would be to create, create a virtual reality hub or, or lab in our library and drive traffic to the library. <clears throat> and um, so we were able to do that, but the other thing we did was we held a demo in our lab and we invited some companies in and we demonstrated some augmented reality, some virtual reality, and we had a, a pretty good turnout for you know a community college. We had about 200 people who showed up. And uh, one of the, uh, we had local physicians and nurses who also showed up and one of the local emergency room physicians, the director of the emergency department uh, decided to purchase uh, a mannequin and augmented reality, a HoloLens one to train his residents in ultrasound. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I'm giving you a long story and it's right here, but fairly short. That led to a conversation with uh, my president and vice president academic who wanted to know from me where I thought a virtual reality was going and uh, so I had a conversation with them, a really good conversation. And in colleges and universities, technology doesn't usually get money or human resources uh, put to it until it reaches a threshold level of interest. But I tried to make the case with them that in order for it to reach a threshold level of interest, uh, it really needed some investment. So I walked away from that meeting feeling pretty good that um, uh, we had a good discussion. They seemed to be in agreement with me. Uh, but also thinking, well, this isn't going to go any further, except, you know, I'm going to continue doing this in my lab and, you know, we'll see where that goes. Oh, a week later, the vice president of academics said, we decided to create a position for this. We'd like you to apply for it. So I did. And uh, now I'm the immersive technology lead for the college. Um, uh, now, I don't know if you could tell from my photo earlier, but um, I was 60 years old when I made the change. So, uh, uh, which means nothing to me. I mean, uh, uh, I might look 60. I feel about you know, 59. Um, that's a joke. And uh, but uh, uh, it's an interesting change of careers. Um, you know, after after all these years in the in the medical field. Um, now, uh, the approach that I took with, um, with immersive technology and virtual reality in particular is that at first the senior management team wanted me to approach the deans and associate deans and get their sort of buy-in to pilot virtual reality. And I said, I'm not going to do that. There's no way that's not going to be successful. Um, because um, teachers, in, and if you're a teacher at a college or, or, or a university or K to 12, you know that nobody tells teachers how to teach. I mean, there's professional development, there are you know, lessons for that sort of thing. Nobody comes to me as an educator or to Tony and says, this is how you're going to teach, right? We're, we're independent. We, we sort of manage our own class. We explore, you know, pedagogy and, and provide learning in a, in a way that we, find, that we believe is most suitable for our students. And the minute that, you know, senior management tries to, you know, dictate how you're going to run a class, uh, it, it's disastrous. And so I said, my objective will be to explore some really compelling virtual reality when I find something that appears to be appropriate to biotech or nursing or paramedics or architecture or um, trades, I'm going to look for the innovators and the early adopters. 
the teachers who are enthusiastic. You know, I'm going to try to find at least two in each program that are willing to explore this, embrace it, and also you know be skeptical about it and know that um, it may translate into <clears throat> full integration into curriculum, or it may not be successful. And so they agreed with that, and that's the approach I've been taking. We've launched 12 pilots so far, and we've built, uh, we're in the process of building three VR labs. So uh, I'll just quickly run down the list. We have virtual reality in our architectural technology program. We launched uh, pilots last semester, or sorry, in the fall semester, rather. Uh, our indigenous studies students are studying language and virtual reality using alt space and engaged VR. Our veterinary technician students are doing animal dissection and animal anatomy VR. Our biotech students are doing VR anatomy and chemistry. Our paramedic students are doing pediatric assessment and resuscitation. Our uh, events management students are learning to organize events in virtual reality, in alt space, in ArtGate, in Engage VR, in Verbella. Our tourism students are starting to do tours and they're working with Barry Tourism and they purchased a 360 degree camera and this summer they're gonna start learning how to organize tours in VR. And we've, uh, we're building a trades lab at our Midland campus and we're, we built a VR lab at our Orangeville campus for nursing. We're going to do patient simulation and, uh, and patient communication there. And we're building a VR lab at our Owen Sound campus for power engineering. Uh, these are students who learn how to operate boiler plants. I have no idea what that means, but um, it's a trades thing. Um, so uh, if we want to go to the next one there. Um, now, I want to start by telling you what's not research. Um, in our veterinary technician program, um, I, I first thought of the vet tech students. These are veterinary technicians, are obviously the people who work with veterinarians. And they go through a two-year community college program, and it's a pretty intensive program. And I first thought of them because um, someone informed me that Virginia Tech University had created this animal anatomy uh, virtual reality application, and it was open source. So we got our hands on it, uh, got a co-op student modified to suit our needs. Uh, I introduced it to the veterinarian who teaches in the program and one of the vet techs who teach in the program. Um, and they really liked it. They thought it was cool, the, the, the whole idea that you can be standing in front of a life-size um, animal was pretty compelling. Uh, we also found uh, that Victory XR, has uh, a series of animal dissections in virtual reality, and that seems really impressive. There's, a, I don't know if you've seen them before, but there's a, an animated instructor who gives a tutorial on how to do the dissection, and then the student actually does the dissection. Um, and there's a scalpel, and there's forceps, and you can pick them up, and you're given instructions on where to make the incision. You can pull out organs and look at them nice and close. Uh, very cool things. And um, uh, the there were 60 vet tech students. I had 20 headsets. So each pilot is a small cohort, typically 10 to 25 students. So, so they had uh, a lottery and uh, 20 people got the headsets and they went through the dissections and they went through the anatomy and then the headsets were given to another 20 students. And so far we've had just 40 students go through the, the applications. And um, about two weeks ago, uh, the veterinarian of the vet tech did a presentation at a conference at my, my college, and uh, they said, uh, interestingly, um, the students who went through the virtual reality animal dissection, animal anatomy, uh, had higher scores in their um, anatomy course. Now, that's not research, that's anecdote, right? Um, part of the problem with that, it's interesting, no question about it, it's compelling, no, no question about it, but it's really anecdotal. and. Uh, you know, part of the problem is that um, it's just, you know, an observation and students tend to self-select. So the students who volunteered to do VR were probably keen to begin with and probably would have done well in anatomy anyway. But uh, it's interesting enough that, you know, it begs the question, maybe we should do some research into, um, you know, the efficacy of learning animal dissection in VR um, and, and does that translate into better performance academically in that a course area, right? So something to think about for next year. <clears throat> and we've already had this discussion. 
Um, and um, so uh, it's great stuff, uh, but it's yeah, it's not research. <laughs> so, go ahead. We um, we've um, we've had a lot of discussions in different areas of doing research. One of the one of the really nice things about being in a community college versus a university is that um, we're not under the same pressure to produce research the way university professors like Tony are, right? So, so we have a little more flexibility. We have a lot of PhDs at our community college, as most colleges do. I would say about half of our, um, just over half of our full-time faculty are PhDs, maybe a third of our part-time faculty are PhDs. Uh, and most of the others are our master's level and some uh, undergrad level uh, who are teaching programs. So there are lots of people interested in doing research. And one of the beautiful things about a community college is you do research when you want to do it, when you feel like there's something really worth researching. So we don't produce anywhere near as much research as universities and university professors do, but we've got that flexibility. And, and this was great for me because um, a lot of universities take the approach with VR that they they look at, um, they develop their own VR application in-house, they beta test it, uh, and then they research it with teachers and professors. And then does it go any further? Does it does it move from exploration to evaluation to research to reevaluation to integration in curriculum? Difficult to say, right? But uh, with us, my my feeling was. Uh, I really wanted to get VR in the hands of as many teachers and as many students as possible um, so they could, one, get through the learning curve of it, um, two, um, start to understand the pedagogical value, the, 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 the concept that you can um, have experiential learning of VR, that you can do things with your hands that can actually be used um, for learning in the cognitive, psychomotor, and affective domains, which is really incredible and unlike any other educational technology um, like it, right? So that's been great. Um, we've, um, because VR is still so new, we're a pretty small community um, and there's a pretty small, but you know, getting bigger all the time network of people who are interested in exploring VR and of course doing research and so I've had conversations with educators from around the world. And uh, recently we, we chatted with um, some professors at uh, Queen's University in Kingston, Can Ontario, Canada. And they uh, wanted to partner with us in St. Lawrence College. <clears throat> and we just recently applied for a very large grant to look at uh, driving and cognitive load. And uh, the, the approach we're going to take to that is is uh, using um, virtual reality for driving simulation, but also we have a driver simulator in our paramedic lab, which is just wrap around video. And um, we're gonna use uh, VR headsets, probably uh, the Vive or the Vargio or the, or the Omniset, the HP Omniset, we're not sure which yet, but, but some sort of device with uh, pretty robust biometrics to measure pupillometry and eye gaze and pulse and uh, galvanic skin sensors and so on um, to uh, sort of quantify their cognitive load, their stress level. And we're going to put drivers both, um, we're going we're to take drivers who are novice, drivers who are uh, professional and drivers who are not professional but experienced and see sort of where, where they're, what, what's their cognitive load uh, as you add more stressors in the driver simulation. So in this simulator, for example, you can be driving on a clear day with very little traffic, and then you add a little bit of traffic that obviously increases people's stress. Maybe a pedestrian comes from between the cars that adds another level of stress. Maybe it starts to rain then you get out on the highway. Um, so our aim is to, to have nine levels of complexity and uh, we might be lucky enough to measure five and uh, we'll see um, you know, how, how drivers do, and hopefully this will inform uh, further driver training. Now, I'll be quite honest, um, when I think about this, um, I think of this research might have a short half-life because we might have autonomous driving in about 30 years, but uh, nonetheless, still worth doing because uh, the intent with this kind of research, and if it translates into better driver training, it means reduction in motor vehicle collisions and uh, trauma and uh, 
having been a paramedic and been to a lot of uh, traumatic car crashes, uh, I really appreciate the idea of reducing injuries. So, uh, really excited about that. And um, we're also uh, looking at um, <clears throat> a partnership with, with um, St. Cloud State University, St. Cloud Technical Community College, uh, University of Calgary, Bow Valley College, uh, and so on and so forth to develop. Um, we're uh, applying for grants shortly, to develop some uh, mental health crisis intervention scenarios and to look at the efficacy of virtual reality scenarios versus traditional role playing. And um, I'm not anticipating that um, role playing in VR will be any better than role playing, say, in a lab with people pretending to be someone in crisis. Uh, but if if they're uh, more or less equal, uh, that's a good thing because we know that we'll be able to use virtual reality for distance learning for crisis intervention, or we can use it to supplement what we do in the lab. Um, you know, eventually we'll get to um, artificial intelligence and voice recognition and and bots essentially who uh, are able to have a, a natural conversation with us and exhibit stress and anxiety and anger and fear. Um, but, um, you know, it's probably 40, 50 years away from now. So that's uh, one of the other projects we're working on. Um, I just wanted to show you a picture of our paramedic lab and what it looks like. And, um, we spend most of the time in the paramedic lab doing scenarios. So they learn skills initially for the first two, three weeks, and then they just do scenario after scenario, after scenario, scenario. And they're evaluated on an ongoing basis as opposed to a sort of practicing and then being evaluated at the end. Um, cause when, we, when we took that approach before, we found that students who were doing consistently well would sometimes bomb the final scenarios and fail, and students who were doing consistently poor um, would excel in the final scenarios and passed, which made absolutely no sense, right? So, so we uh, we use a um, uh, uh, we use an evaluation process that that goes from semester one right through semester fourteen, and and get an overall sort of impression of the student's performance. Um, the next one there. Um, this is what we're doing in our uh, advanced care paramedic program currently. So students are learning pediatric assessment and resuscitation. And in the fall, they're going to be doing adult resuscitation. And this is a program from Health Scholars that uses voice recognition and artificial intelligence. And it's really geared towards the, um, the you know, third year or fourth year student. It's not really an entry level type of thing because this is um, these patient simulations are aimed at uh, testing and evaluating your assessment skills, your decision making skills, your diagnostic skills, and your intervention skills. And this one is interesting in the sense that the student um, stands in a room with a sick person or a dead person on the floor. <laughs> Sorry to be so blunt. And um, there's a team of avatars around them, and each avatar has a name tag. And the student basically has a conversation with the team. So. So the paramedic student will say, Aaron, can you check for a pulse? Bill, can you start chest compressions? Fatima, can you um, defibrillate the patient? Ross, can you start an intravenous line? That doesn't all happen that quickly because teams never move that fast. <laughs> and, uh, and so they run through the whole resuscitation and the student has to look at the monitor, has to interpret the ECG rhythm, has to interpret the vital signs, has to initiate treatments, give the right drug and the right dose at the right time, the right uh, patient and so on. Um, and at the end, the analytics gives them a printout of what they did, the sequence in which they did it, the time it took them to do it, um, and um, what they missed. Um, but what's also particularly cool about this program is it is it monitors situational awareness. So if if it's a cardiac arrest situation and um, one of the avatars is doing chest compressions, sometimes, like in real life, the person doing chest compressions gets tired and will start to slow down, and the student actually whoops, <laughs> the student actually actually has to notice that 
the CPR is slowing down and prompt and speak to the avatar and say, you need to speed up your compressions or they need to swap someone out who's not tired to start doing compressions. Um, so uh, they also have to monitor how the patient's uh, being, uh, how the breathing is being done for the patient as well. because They may slow down or breathe too fast. Um, so I think it's incredible that this technology actually monitors situational awareness. Um, Speaking of situational awareness, coming back to the driving component. So, you know, as I mentioned, we're looking at doing research into cognitive load. But the other thing that's uh, cool about eye tracking with driver simulation is um, when you're driving a vehicle and suddenly you realize there's a crash in front of you and you're about to crash into those other vehicles, instinctively we look at the crash and try to avoid it. In driver training, when we're training our paramedics on how to drive, we train them not to look at the crash, but to look at where they want to go. You're more likely to avoid the crash if you look to where you want to go. So at the end of a driver simulation, we could say to the student, um, where did you look, the crash or where you wanted to go? And they could say, oh, yeah, I looked where I wanted to go. And, uh, you know, but if we use eye tracking and we know exactly where they look, we could say, yeah, bullshit, you were looking at the crash, right? not where you wanted to go. So. Um, we can we can assess and modify that behavior uh, using eye tracking, which is very cool. So um, getting back to um, the, the, the medical simulation with the, with the paramedic students, uh, the plan this fall, if all works out, is to uh, do a study where we randomize students to lab training only versus lab training supplemented by virtual reality see if there's a difference in performance. And my hope is uh, that um, that that um, being able to do scenarios repeatedly in virtual reality will translate to better performance in the lab and better performance in the field. But we'll see, right? Um, people who uh, ultimately, when you do a randomized control trial like that, people who analyze the data in the end have to be blinded as to who the students were, right? Whether they were lab only or lab supplemented by virtual reality. So they, they just appear as numbers and they look at performance, right? So, so it's gotta be a, a ideally randomized and, and blinded. Um, so uh, that's what we're doing. We are, um, uh, we also received a uh, uh, Futures Canada Centre grant of about 800,000 this year. And we're looking at uh, some additional research into uh, use of XR for changing perceptions around homelessness and cultural debiasing, um, and looking at uh, faculty and staff comfort with use of virtual reality. Um, so that should be interesting as well. And I'm just, um, I'm not a, uh, uh, I don't lead research typically. I've been, I've participated in, in a number of research projects. I've been a contributing author to a number of research papers, particularly in the medical field. Um, but uh, generally, I'm, a, I'm an enabler and a champion of research, and uh, I'm happy to do the grunt work while uh, the smarter people than me, like Tony and Michael here, um, do the lead on research. <clears throat> so, that's it in a, in a nutshell. That's sort of what we're doing. Lots of activities, lots of balls up in the air at the moment, and uh, uh, I'm really hoping we get more and more uh, PhD students, PhD students who are interested in in researching um, uh, immersive uh, immersive learning. Lots of things through lots of. Let's give her some applause emojis. Thank you, Thank Rob. You. That's fantastic. It's really, um, it's amazing the breadth of the different projects you're into, because most of the time when we hear talks, they tend to be focused on, you know, we're doing this one research project or this one implementation, whereas it's interesting to hear someone who's kind of running a broader program than that and looking at opportunities to implement. And it's this breadth that you have because of that is quite interesting. It's We don't meet too many people yet who have that breadth. It's sort of unusual yeah. still in VR. So. Um, so fascinating. So what I'm going to do, everybody, is I will open up the uh, raise hands button. Just give me one second here, if I can get my menus to work properly. 
So I'll allow the raise hands button. So in the bottom right, you should have just seen a little button pop up called raise hands. If you click on that, it'll put you on a speakers list. And then we can use that to, um, to uh, address questions uh, to Rob, if anybody has any questions at this point. So feel free, click the raise hands button. And, um, but I'm gonna jump in first and ask a question because the host, so I can do that. <laughs> um, uh -huh. <laughs> One of the questions I wanted to ask Rob, I was thinking when doing this is, you've got some simulations that are quite sophisticated in terms of the interactability with you know, very interactive objects you mm -hmm. can control. I mean, I built this world, but for example, this is very static, right? There's not interactable objects here other than a screen and things like that. So how do you get these built? Where does the money come? Who does it? Yep. And then tied with that, um, even the headsets, where do the headsets come from? How do the, do the students rent them? Are they just part of the program? So yep. some logistics on that I was just curious about. Yeah, so um, a lot of programs, as you described, will, will build their own virtual reality experience using students who are in the XR development program. Um, and they'll beta test them, and then they'll do some research around them. Um, I'm too impatient for that. Um, and I think maybe it's because I'm a paramedic, and I like to make things happen quickly, and I like to see results quickly. I like to see them change quickly. But uh, I was really lucky. I was able to persuade uh, senior management at our college to let me take this piloted approach using off-the-shelf products. So that's what we've done. We've, uh, almost all of the products we use are off the shelf, with some exceptions. Um, so that's why we've been able to launch so many pilots simultaneously. And um, this actually started, I actually took this position before COVID hit. And, um, you know, because of my background, uh, I, was, I was a paramedic during uh, the SARS outbreak in, 20, in 2003. And I was actually a base hospital program manager at that time. And I was part of the provincial um, operating uh, committee um, to address the SARS outbreak at that time. And, and so when I heard about COVID-19, I knew um, in January, I knew it was gonna end up in school closures. That was just my gut feeling. Um, and so I went to our vice president academic and I said, um, we're gonna end up with college closures and we need our center for teaching and learning to, to start to gear up uh, and prepare for synchronous online learning right away. So we started doing that maybe four weeks before the schools closed. Uh, so we were a little bit ahead of the game, but anyway, my point is we 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 started into virtual reality uh, before COVID hit, and and we were able to um, uh, launch several pilots simultaneously. And the school was enthusiastic about um, putting some money into it. And when COVID hit, of course, uh, there was a, a heightened level of interest in exploring this new experiential learning platform. Um, so I. You know, because of COVID, I was more interested in virtual reality for distance learning as opposed to virtual reality in a lab, uh, because it wasn't much point in opening labs. All the labs around the world were closed down because of you know infection control concerns and so on. So we we have about uh, 200 VR headsets. About 118 are deployed for distance learning. We've been using mostly the Quest and the Quest Two, um, which has become a pain in the buttocks, as you know, because of the Facebook Oculus uh, sign in. Thing. So what we did, what we did was we created some college Facebook uh, accounts, put multiple headsets on each account, which um, the uh, terms of agreement allow from Oculus Facebook. I'm hoping uh, Facebook Oculus will come up with an education solution that's affordable and viable. I'm really disappointed to see Vive didn't with their Focus 3 and their, and their um, Vive Pro 2. Uh, but don't get me wrong, those headsets look really great. We're gonna, probably going to purchase some and look at them for maybe VR labs. Uh, but that's that's sort of what we've done logistically. Uh, I would say when you when you reach about a hundred headsets, uh, maybe maybe fewer, maybe fifty, you really have to have a mobile device management system, a, a software system yeah. that allows you to load software onto headsets remotely and take it off headsets. Can we? We didn't actually go to an MDM until we hit about 120 headsets. Um, wow. And um, uh, that's worked really well. Now, the MDMs, a lot of them are very expensive. We negotiated a really great price uh, uh, with um, Arbor XR. I can't tell you what the price is because they've asked us not to share it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. It's, it's, 
it's reasonable. And, uh, you know, one of the good things about this technology being fairly new to education is companies are pretty receptive to negotiating prices with you. Um, so that's sort of some of the logistics in a nutshell. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I speak, I suppose some of the companies are still in that mindset of like, really just trying to promote it. Like, like th this idea that the quest doesn't make much money off the sales of the quest. Cause again, they're, they're trying to promote the industry as much as they're trying to sell a product. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's that kind of a talk about it, but yeah. Yeah. Have you gotten any pushback? Have you come across anyone in your institution who was just like, Nope, VR is a silly video game and it's not for professional education. Yeah. Yeah. We have, um, uh, in fact, it's been real heartbreaking because our um, our pre-service fire and policing programs, um, we got some pushback there, and um, uh, but the the um, there's been a, a, a change over in management recently. So I'm going to approach them again. There's um, there's a, a fire simulation, a firefighting simulation called Flame, F-L-A-I-M. That's, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it looks incredible. And I can't wait to go see a demo. It's, um, it's a mixed, a, a, maybe mixed reality isn't the right description, but it's a very robust virtual reality simulation where um, you're wearing a virtual reality headset, you're wearing a helmet as you would as a firefighter. Uh, you have a self-contained breathing apparatus on your back, except the tank on your back. It looks like a regular tank, but it's actually the computer. And instead of having oh, cool. hand controls, you have a hose, a heavy hose nozzle. feels like a, a fire hose nozzle, and it's tethered to the ground. So you've got some resistance when you try to pull the hose. Um, and in VR, you're fighting a whole array of different fires, like uh, kitchen fire in a condo, uh, um, jet fuel on a, on a tarmac, uh, an wow. electric car fire, um, just the kind of firefighting experience you would never get uh, as a firefighter, except in the real world, or maybe in some cases when, when they do, uh, you know, they have firehouses where they set the yeah. fire, but you wouldn't get the same variety, right? So um, it, it looks incredible to me. I can't wait to take our pre-service fire faculty uh, maybe to New York or somewhere to, to try it out and see if we can get it um, at our school. So, yeah, we did get some some uh, uh, pushback there, and um, yeah. uh, and this is we why um, when you you, you got to find faculty you're interested, in, yeah, and and then sort of pick it up the line. One of the things we found too is that um, you get pushback, and then often one of the best ways to get rid of pushback is put the VR headset on their head and have them experience it, and then they go. Oh, I get it now. You know, yeah. not everything's perfect. Don't get me wrong, but experiencing it is often what people need. Um, we do have a couple of people on the speakers list. So, uh, Isram, I will give you the megaphone, and you are up. You we should be able to hear you. Isram, are you out there somewhere? Wave your arms. Oh, hi. Sorry, is that me? LSRM. Yes, there we are. Yes, we can. Hi, hear you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Hi, yeah, sorry. It's my initials. Hi, I'm Luke. Oh. Um, th that, that, <laughs> sorry. It was, that was a that, um, brilliant talk. Um, I really, really enjoyed it because it's pro probably mm -hmm. the most inspirational one I've seen so far because it, it, it gels with so many things I've looked at. Um, I was particularly interested in, um, you know, we, I'm a, I work in a secondary school in the UK. Uh, or across five schools, uh, and I'm really interested in how he might take advantage of of VR, particularly things like the Quest, because some of the educational mm. VR sets that could be managed just don't seem so sophisticated. Um, you mentioned um, Arbor XR, which I haven't looked at, but can you use that to manage um, Quest and Quest Twos, or is that only for other platforms? Yep, it works. It works on any Android device. Oh, that's fantastic. I'll definitely have a look into that. That's brilliant. Thank you. And th thanks for the talk. It's excellent. Thank you. Oh, what happened to Tony? I think Tony had to re-enter or something. Um, let's see if um, I've got the control panel. Let me see if uh, or any other hands. Hang ready. on. I've got it. Oh, uh, got it. Next okay. is George. Whoops, George, where'd you go? Um, okay. How thanks. about Kim? Okay, George, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Oh, great. Uh, hi, Rob. Thank you for Hello. sharing all of this information. 
Uh, well, I, I just wanted to ask if, uh, have you used any kind of methodology for developing these kind of projects? Uh, I mean, well, the, the thing is that developing this kind of educational projects in VR requires uh, a lot of time and a lot of effort for, for project management. So have you used any kind of specific methodology for uh, working with uh, specialists in, in the respective area? Uh, I mean, the, the, the people who know uh, about the specific topic that you are going to teach through mm -hmm. augmented reality or how have you managed that? Thank you. Yep. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I've taken a pretty, a fairly unsophisticated approach. So what I've done is, is um, you know, if I come across a, what I think is a really compelling virtual reality experience that would apply to a certain program area, um, uh, I get a, um, a trial on a headset or a couple of headsets. I go out and meet faculty, I get them to see it. So as Tony said, you know, they get to see it and they go, wow, or they go, yeah, this doesn't interest me. <laughs> um, and, we, you know, we have kind of a casual discussion around uh, what course or courses would you use, could you envision using this uh, virtual reality experience in? Um, and then I get them to fill out a form. So they, in, in the form, they would answer questions like, um, who's the teacher in this course, who's the coordinator of this program, um, in what course would virtual reality be, be used, list the objectives that would be addressed through virtual reality. So, you know, for example, um, in a virtual reality anatomy, uh, it can address almost every single learning objective for uh, courses in the first and second semester. So it's a, uh, a program that's ideally suited for VR for distance learning. Um, in another program, animal dissection, you know, in veterinary technician, really only addresses a couple of learning objectives, so maybe not ideal for, for VR for distance learning. And um, so when we go through that, you know, we, we decide, is this ideally suited for VR for distance learning or is it better suited for a VR lab? Um, and maybe it doesn't address a lot of objectives, but does it address learning objectives that would otherwise, in the words of Jeremy Balenson, be dangerous, impossible, counterproductive, or expensive, or just difficult or impractical? Um, you know, so for example, um, virtual reality experience for learning how to work at heights um, only addresses one or two learning objectives um, but those learning objectives would be really difficult to do in the trade, right? They'd have to be at heights and use the, the harnesses and devices. Um, so um, we look at it that way. And then uh, at the end of a semester, you know, we get um, faculty feedback, we get student feedback, and we have a discussion around, um, is this worth integrating into, um, uh, into, into curriculum? Uh, is it ideal for VR for distance learning or lab? Uh, and then, um, you know, just to get back to Tony's earlier question, in terms of logistics, we, uh, the school has purchased all of the headsets. Um, we get the full integration, you know, we'll have to have the discussion around, do the students buy the headsets or, or do we per provide the headsets on a rental basis and the students purchase the software? Um, so I don't, I don't know if that answered your question, but um, um, I find, uh, the process I have is, you know, not terribly rigorous, um, but our nursing program, uh, they are exceedingly good at process. So uh, the, 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 uh, the qualifications, so the, the requirements for going from pilot to curriculum integration is going to be a lot more rigorous with them. And I'm hoping that's going to inform my process for other programs. I uh, hope that answered your question. Absolutely. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I'm back. Sorry when I went away there for a moment. <laughs> the <laughs> internet is not always perfect, it turns out. Um, no. We have mm -hmm. a, a, one more speaker on our list. Carol, I'll give you the megaphone. Carol? Yes. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Hi, Carol. Um, Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I'm a PhD student and I'm wondering, is there kind of a training regarding how to conduct research in VR? Is there any event like training, like oh, what uh, method is usually used and uh, how to collect data like that? Uh, yeah, I'll leave that, I that 
Yeah, as a question, <laughs> because I, I hope to learn like what what are the measurements like when we uh, study uh, VR uh, and related to curriculum. Uh, if we publish paper, we need to prove it's an effective, um, you know, setting or learning objective. So I hope to learn and, uh, you know, try to do some research on my own as well. Thank you. It's a pretty broad question, uh, Tony. I mean, yeah, I mean, it depends partly on whether you're looking at qualitative or quantitative uh, research or, or both. But I'll, I think Tony's more qualified to answer that question than me. Well, I, I can touch on it for sure. I think that one of the challenges right now is exactly what you are kind of coming up with, which is you're like, hey, I'd like to get into VR research. Is there somewhere I can go where I can learn about how to do VR research? And the short answer is either no, there isn't, or B, you're already here, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Like, there, it's just because it's so new. Right now, everybody is just kind of going into their own area and saying, this is what I'm working on, and they figure out the methodologies and the techniques and what they're going to measure and what's appropriate to measure and what they can measure because of the, the, cha the technological challenges. Um, and then, you know, it's just basic research design where you say you just simply have to design it from sort of that bottom up fundamental principles idea, which is just designed for what is it I want to achieve? Just start with the question, what goal do I want to achieve with this research? What am I trying to accomplish? And then just really structuring mm -hmm. what you measure and how you measure it in the way that you will measure things that will allow you to collect data or information, whether it's quantitative, qualitative. Um, that will allow you to address the question or the purpose of the research in the first place. And that's something that people lose sometimes with this. They get very focused on technology and I can measure this and that. Mm -hmm. And they do what they can, not necessarily what they need to do to actually achieve the objective. And um, so right now, the short answer is there isn't a lot of, of resources to go to, to be honest with you. That's part of mm -hmm. one of the main reasons we created this community is because we found that a lot of researchers, when they struggle with something, even if like, let's say Rob's working in nursing and I'm working in some completely different part of VR related work, mm -hmm. but because we're both, both working with training with VR and a lot of similar hardware issues and a lot of the similar sort of like general issues, like the idea about Facebook logging in and things like that, we found that if you build a community, then we can all ask those questions of each other and figure out you know, sometimes you, you'll, I'll hear someone give a presentation, I'll go, oh, that's a great way to measure that variable. I'd never thought of doing it that way before. And so that's kind of what we created this community for, to be honest with you, is to help you with exactly that kind of a thing. But, um, and this community is just growing. So we don't have a lot of resources yet, but we're building towards that. So I wish I had a better answer for you, but unfortunately I don't have anything else. Rob, do you have anything else you can sort of jump in on there? Any ideas? No, I th but I think there are lots of unanswered research questions. There's, there's a lot of research in, you know, quote unquote, virtual reality, but it's based on 2D virtual reality, you know, things like Second yeah. Life. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not convinced uh, you can you can look at research from Second Life and generalize it to immersive virtual reality because the feeling, the sense of presence in immersive virtual so reality different. is different and embodiment is different when you're looking at research in the affective domain. Uh, but there are also some areas where you know, the research has been done um, in, in, other, in other senses. I'll give you an example. Um, so our indigenous studies um, program, they have four language courses, one in each semester. And the first semester, the course is called Language in the Home. And I don't know anything about teaching language, but it, it, it seemed to me, um, if you're learning language in the home, wouldn't it be great to actually be in a home, you know? Um, so I did, a bit of, I did a bit of a lit search um, and there is literature to support the idea of context-based learning, that, that context-based learning uh, improves retention. There's also evidence to suggest that um, when you have context and you add interactivity, so you're able to open cupboards or pick up plates, uh, that also improves uh, level of uh, retention of words and sentences and conversations to a slightly higher level. Um, so. Uh, where do you get that context? Uh, can you get it by looking at images in a book? Can you get it from going to a house? Um, uh, I think it's uh, more immersive. You actually come into virtual reality and you're in a house and you can walk through the house and outside the house and have conversations there. Um, so, you know, uh, for context-based learning for our indigenous studies, we're probably, I don't anticipate us doing any research around that area uh, at this point, um, you know, because the, the research for context-based learning already exists, but uh, man, is it ever 
compelling to be in a house with students. And the, yeah. The other area that might be interesting uh, for research is, you know, especially under the, the current circumstances, the, the pandemic, um, students really lack connection with other students. And you don't really get a good connection with your classmates on a video call with your teacher. You, you've got to connect outside of the classroom, right? And there's a much greater depth of connection, much greater intimacy in a place like Alt Space VR, where you can be face to face with classmates and have conversations um, and and connect outside of the classroom and socialize and, and be able to do group work or just be able to you know have a conversation around did you understand you know that explanation an hour ago about such and such and the other student go well, I think what they meant was this and um, you know that that kind of interactivity is lacking now but VR is a platform for, for having it right well, um, oh, we just have one more person on the speakers list. We have about two minutes left, so we'll just jump to our last uh, question. Arcangelo, oh, you are on the air. Arcangelo? Out there anywhere? No. Nope. Going. Going. Oh, oh, oh wait. Going. We're right here. We're right here. You want to speak to me, buddy? Uh, we got a lot of feedback uh, coming through your microphone. We're gonna have to mute him. We're gonna have to mute him. Italy. Hey. hey. Can we hear you now? Can we hear you now? I don't speak English. Uh. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, so that is uh, our event for today. So uh, again, let's uh, give Rob a big uh, hand round of emojis for his presentation. Um, thank you very much. It was great. A real pleasure. Really interesting discussion. Great. Um, so that is the event, end of the event for today. Again, uh, we're here uh, every Monday. Um, we do these events. Um, we have a number of upcoming speakers. Uh, next week we have Tommy Erickson will be speaking. Um, so we have another speaker. So take a look at that. Um, and that is basically our event for today. So I'll be hanging around. I don't know if Rob's hanging around at all or whether he'll go, but yeah. thank you very much, everybody. We'll just kind of move out into the space. Feel free to chat amongst yourselves or you can leave or you can stay, whatever you like. But thank you. It's been another good, really good event. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thanks, for, Rob. Thanks for doing this. It was great. Pleasure.